this record button because I realize I'm, I'm not recording. Um, and so you guys are going to be doodling, taking some notes. She's going to be sharing some awesome things from the work she gets to do as a, for a living, which is a pretty sweet gig. And obviously, as we get into this conversation, you're going to realize we're looking at survival systems through the lens of the past. But also, I want you to be thinking about the back of your mind as we start to dive into more work, how some of these thoughts and ideas, these thought nuggets can fit to your lives today, as well as we start hanging out with NASA and thinking about living on the moon and Mars. Doesn't matter our time or space and place, there's some pretty cool things that can overlap and help us be successful no matter what. So, enough of my rant and raving. It's time for uh, the awesome, pretty intelligent person who has a book coming out live tomorrow on this very top, not this particular topic, but this time period, uh, Callie Moore. Um, so I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to hand over to you, let you introduce yourself, and then uh, go ahead and work your magic. So thank you so much for uh, taking time to hang out with all of us today. Yeah, thank you all so much for having me. I'm very excited to talk to you guys today about extinction and survival. And I am a paleontologist. I get paid to work with fossils day in and day out, which is a pretty, pretty cool gig, as um, your teacher said. So I also host a YouTube channel called PBS Eons. Anybody out there an Eons fan? Anybody? Couple of you, yeah, right on. Round of applause for that. If you haven't seen Eon, please go check it out. I bet you'll find an episode that you like. Um, and I do have a book coming out tomorrow. It's called Tales of the Prehistoric World and it's fully illustrated. It's a beautiful book. I'm very excited about it. Um, maybe you'll get one for Christmas or something this year or holiday season. So without all this nonsense about me, let's talk about some death, some really, really, really old death. So I'm going to share my screen real quick. Um, where did it go? Let's see here. That's my desktop. <sighs> Sorry, I just did this and it worked totally. Hmm. Where did I go? Shoot. Ah, here it is. All right. Let's get this going. And it's at the very end, of course. Boom. All right. So extinctions, ends of eras or or maybe not uh, for this little creature right here, which we're going to talk about. All right, so let's get into it. So today I want to talk to you about extinctions. What are they? That's the first thing that we're going to talk about. And then we're going to go into the big five major mass extinctions. So there's been five really, really, really big major mass extinctions through the history of our planet. Then I'll get into survival. So how life recovers after one of these big extinction events. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about today is Lystrosaurus. So this is like a survivor case study here. So let's just jump in. So extinctions, what are they? So I want you to think to yourself, maybe I see you guys have some note paper down for taking notes. So I want you to write down what your definition of an extinction is. It doesn't have to be a mass extinction, but what, what is an extinction? What's your definition? I'll give you just a couple of seconds to write down some stuff. Nice. Yeah, what is an extinction? How would you describe it to a friend or a family member? All right. So my definition, not to cut any of you off in your train of thought, but it is, it is, there we go, the disappearance of a group or organism globally. So that means there are no more of it anywhere to be found anywhere on the globe, okay? So what causes an extinction? Well, there is a lot, a lot of different factors, which we'll actually go into. 
So some causes. And now I want you to, to know that none of these causes um, exist in a bubble by themselves. So a lot of these work together with other causes and things like that. <clears throat> So one of the first is like a large bolide impact. So that means just a giant space rock comes down and hits our planet. So I'm actually wearing my Chicxulub shirt today. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more later in this talk. So this is like what killed the dinosaurs, basically. So big meteor comes down, boom, hits the planet. It's a very, very bad day, months, weeks, and years that finish, um, that come after that impact. Then you can also have solar radiation. So like UV light, UV is not good for us. It's not good for our genes. It's not good for the makeup of our body. And every once in a while, our, our um, ozone layer can be very, very poorly damaged. Like when I was growing up as a kid, there was a hole in our ozone layer and it was a big deal. And luckily we figured it out and it has healed now. But in the past, there's been other things that have happened that has increased our solar radiation. And again, this is really bad for life if we don't have an ozone layer. Plate tectonics is another thing that can cause mass extinction. So plate tectonics is just the natural motion of our plates, the land masses across our globe. So you guys know probably that they have changed over time. We've had supercontinents where all the land smashes together. It spreads apart like it is now. But anytime the plates come together and smash into one another, it can build mountain ranges. And then the mountains go up and they start to erode down and all that weathering goes into the ocean and it actually is a CO2 sink. So it pulls CO2 out of the atmosphere. So this can trigger like cooling, mass cooling, so you can get ice ages. On the flip side, if a plate is spreading apart, there's usually a lot of volcanism, it's spewing CO2 and other toxic gases into the atmosphere and that can cause global warming. So volcanoes are another huge cause of mass extinction. So there have been some extremely large volcanism in our past, and we call these large igneous provenances. You don't have to worry about that part. And we'll talk about one in particular here a little bit later, and I'm going to blow your minds with some massive numbers on the amount of lava that comes out of these. But again, you get all of this CO2, all these toxic gases, which can cause climate change. So climate change, I think, is one of the key causes of, of, of an extinction event, of any kind of extinction event. Usually there's a trigger, something happens, and then the climate change, and then things die because of that climate change. You can also have sea level change. So this is kind of rolled into climate change. So when ice sheets grow, they suck water up into them. And so that can lower the sea level. So if you live in a shallow marine environment and all of a sudden the water level drops, that's really bad for you, right? On the flip side, if it gets really, really warm, all the ice melts, the sea levels come up, that again changes sea level it goes up and things, again, get pushed out of where they used to live because it's no longer habitable for them. So sea level change is another big one. Then marine anoxia. So this just means that there is no oxygen in the water anymore or in an area of it. It's called a dead zone. And we actually have these in our modern oceans, which is really scary. So actually right at the Mississippi River Delta, there's a big dead zone. So you have all these fertilizers, all of this agricultural runoff, and it makes these giant algal blooms. So the toxic algal blooms. And when those little algae die, that's actually what sucks the oxygen out of the water. So if you're a fish, even though you're breathing water, you're still breathing air. And if there's no air for you to breathe in the water, then you die. So marine anoxia is a major cause. And the last one is methane hydrite release. So methane is a super greenhouse gas. It is really bad. It's way worse than CO2, but luckily it usually stays frozen at the bottom of the ocean. So there's areas with a lot of methane, but it usually stays frozen at the bottom of the ocean. Now, what happens if your oceans get really hot? Well, it can cause the methane to release and go into the atmosphere. And that is a bad 
situation all around. So all of these things kind of can work together, work in tandem and kind of create almost a feedback cycle. So if something happens, it gets worse, it triggers something else to get worse, then something else gets worse and it just keeps going and it gets worse, worse and worse. So more than 95% of all species that have ever lived, that have ever been on this planet are extinct now. So extinctions are a natural part of the evolutionary process. But this normal loss, something that we think of as a normal loss is called the background extinction rate. So on this little figure here, it's all of the stuff in green. So this is normal, normal extinction rate down here. And you can see we've got some peaks, which we'll talk about in just a second. So around, if we look at the fossil record, around 10 to 100 species per year go extinct naturally. Just their natural changes, natural part of our evolutionary process. But this is different for different groups of organisms. So the extinction rate is different for different types of animals. So mammal species, for example, are around on average for about a million years. So Homo sapiens, that's us. We might be a little different because we can do a lot of things that changes um, whether or not we're going to make it to a million years. But our predecessor, Homo erectus, was around actually for over a million years. So we have some hominins in our family tree that actually made it for at least a million years on our planet. So again, mammal species are around for about a million years. But this all this extinction is usually balanced by the rise of new species. So you don't really see a big change overall. And so extinction creates speciation. So these animals go extinct and then new animals move in and diversify in those habitats that were left open by the extinction, okay? So again, extinctions usually aren't a bad thing, but every once in a while, this background extinction rate is completely exceeded. So you can see here, if I drew this little red line in here, this is roughly the background extinction rate somewhere in here. And you can see all these peaks, those are mass extinctions. That's where the extinction rate greatly exceeded these normal levels and it's catastrophic, absolutely catastrophic. So our normal background extinction rate is usually pretty slow, it's pretty consistent, it's like, okay. And then these mass extinctions are incredibly fast and very, very bad. So usually about 50% of all species go extinct in less than 2 million years. And it's usually less than a million years. And I know a million years does seem like a very long time, but geologically, a million years is like a blink of an eye. Because again, there's 4.6 billion years of Earth's history. And if 50% of your life or more goes extinct within a million years, that's pretty substantial. Now, there's a couple of other extinction events that I'm not going to be talking about. These are some Cambrian extinction events. They are fairly new. They are still being debated on the magnitude, like how bad really was it? So we're not going to talk about those. We're going to talk about the classic big five. So the end Ordovician, end Devonian, end Permian, end Triassic, and end Cretaceous, probably the most famous of them all. All right, so let's get into the big five. And I have some notes here, so I apologize if I'm looking away every once in a while. So the big five major mass extinction events. So we're going to work through time. We're going to go from oldest to youngest. So the very first big mass extinction event, number one, is the late Ordovician extinction event. Now, sometimes they call it end Ordovician, sometimes they call it late Ordovician. It's the same event. So this happens about 440 million years ago and about an 85% extinction rate. So a lot. This is the second largest mass extinction in our Earth's history. So what we had is we had actually a couple of pulses um, happening. There was two major pulses that happened. So you had this major cooling event followed by a rapid warming event. Now I will also mention at this time in the Ordovician, there's really no life on land. I mean, there is a little bit like some really, really tiny plants and maybe some little arthropods like mites. Uh, but that's it. That's all that's on 
our planet's surface. So this extinction took place in our oceans. This is where all of the life basically died, was in our oceans. So this first pulse, we had this major cooling event. So if your life is living again in this beautiful, shallow, warm sea, and then everything cools down, and you have a glaciation happen, and it drops the sea level, and all of a sudden this area that used to be full of life is now above water. That's, that's pretty bad for all that life. So that was the first pulse, wipes out all of these warm, shallow sea individuals. So the survivors of this extinction event were adapted for cold water environments. Then about 25 million years later, there was a rapid warming event that really put a lot of stress on all of those cold water survivors. So you kind of had a two-fold extinction event here. Now, a couple of the triggers for this could be, at least for the cooling part of it, the warming part is not as well understood as the cooling, but there's two kind of fun triggers for this cooling. One was the growth of the Appalachian Mountains. So the Appalachian Mountains started growing over 400 million years ago. That's actually why they're short, so short today is because they've been eroded for over 400 million years. But again, these big mountains go up, they erode down, and all of that erosion pulls CO2 out of the atmosphere. So that could drop CO2 and cause a major cooling. The other thing is that, like, although like 99% of life was in the oceans, there was a few things living on land. And so this very start of terrestrial life, the land life, could have been another cause of pulling down the CO2. Now, again, the warming event ugh, is still being debated, uh, but we think it might have been um, volcanic eruptions, when in doubt, volcanic eruptions. So again, you get a bunch of CO2, greenhouse gases, warms everything back up um, and melts your ice caps. So that's the late Ordovician extinction event. Now, who was affected by this? Well, obviously marine creatures. Now, what's really crazy about the late Ordovician, and it's an 85 extinction rate. Again, that's really big. This is the second largest of all, of all time. But nothing like no major groups went extinct. They all just took massive hits. So for example, the trilobites down here, again, they took a big hit, but they survived. Um, the coral, these little yellow things over here, these are rugos corals, took a huge hit, they survived. The nautiloids, like um, Orthoceros back here, which was huge, probably 25 feet long or something like that. Again, these nautiloids, there's a couple of them uh, uh, in this image, took major hits, but didn't go fully extinct. And then again, the crinoids, these little sea lilies over here, took a major hit, but didn't go all the way extinct. So all of these groups lost a ton of species, but they made it through. Now the late Devonian extinction event. So again, this takes place around yeah, 359 million years ago. It had an extinction rate of about 75%. And one of the funnest causes, I, a funnest, I don't know if that's, that's probably not the right word to use for mass death. But anyways, um, so you had another glaciation, but this time it was caused by new forests. So you can see in this image back here, we've got plants, we've got big trees, we've got all these weird other little plants. The first forest evolved during the late Devonian. So by the time uh, this Devonian extinction happens, we have huge forests covering the land. Now, there were probably a lot of pulses with this extinction event too. We think there might have been as many as 10 times when the extinction rate exceeded the background rate over the course of about 25 million years. So there was a lot of little extinction events that we kind of group into one mass extinction event. Now, for whatever reason, life on land, anything that was living on land during the late Devonian didn't really be, it wasn't really affected. The major extinctions happened in the oceans again. Now, 
the Devonian extinction event is one of our least understood extinction events. So if any of you are out there and you're interested in mass extinctions, I would highly encourage you to start looking at the late Devonian. Because I'm going to give you a list here of all of the things that people have suggested as being the cause of this mass extinction event. So large volcanism, of course, vol volcanoes, uh, always. An asteroid impact for this one too. Um, a hole in the ozone layer that allowed damaging UV radiation to get to the ground. Okay, all right. So the newly formed forest sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere, caused global warming, and even a supernova has been proposed. So a supernova that happened way out in our galaxy, but it happened to be facing towards Earth and it spewed a bunch of stuff at us, at our planet. And so there's a lot of ideas about the late Devonian, but we just really don't, we don't have a very clear picture on this one. Now, the main extinction, the group that disappeared during this time were the placoderms. So this one here on screen is called Dunkleosteus. It's the largest and the placoderms were armored fishes. And they all went extinct at the end of the Devonian. None of them made it through. So there was God, that is a dead lineage no more. But most other jawed vertebrates made it through okay, and even the jawless fish, so this weird little spiky-faced fish over here is called an agnathan, so they have no jaw, um, and they made it through. They took a big hit, but they made it through. But the big placoderms, these armored fish, wiped out completely by the end Devonian, or the late Devonian extinction event. Now on to the Permian. So this one gets a star because the Permian is the largest mass extinction in our planet's history. So this happens 252 million years ago, 95% extinction rate, 95, only 5% 5 of life across the entire planet made it through this extinction event. This is the closest our planet has ever been to total annihilation of life. This was really bad. This, this is the worst, if you will. So massive volcanic eruptions causing extreme global warming. That seems to be the main cause of this one. So because it is so bad, we call it the Great Dying. So that's what it has been nicknamed as. So this massive volcanic eruptions, they happened in Siberia or what would become Siberia. And the lava that was spewed from these were, so instead of thinking about like Mount St. Helens and big volcano, these are like fissures in the ground that crack open and lava just like oozes out of them. But it oozes and covers over a million square miles. Lava covering a million square miles, over a million square miles. And in some places, it was two and a half miles thick. That's a lot of lava. That's also a lot of greenhouse gases going into our atmosphere. Like tons, trillions, hundreds of trillions of tons of CO2 were released. Trillions of tons. That's insane. That's a lot. It's hard to understand because it's way more than what we're doing right now on like humans are doing. So it was really bad. So this extreme global warming, let me give you some numbers here on, on how hot it really got. So temperatures on land reached a sweltering 140 degrees Fahrenheit, 140. I don't think anywhere on our planet since humans have been keeping track have ever got to 140 degrees Fahrenheit on land. There were toxic gases that it, it destroyed our ozone layer. So again, those UV radiation coming in. Acid rain killed forests and blooms of bacteria and algae choked rivers and lakes. So basically all the water was spoiled. In the ocean, it was as hot as a hot tub. So pr the ocean water was approaching about 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Can you imagine going to the beach and setting in the water and having it feel like a hot tub? That's, that's incredible. The increase of CO2 reacted with the seawater and made it more acidic, so our oceans became acidic. And this prevented all sorts of stuff like shells, like little, little marine life can't create their shells because the water is actually too acidic. 
and huge areas of the oceans became anoxic. So again, these dead zones where nothing can live because there's no water in, or there's no, there's no water in the oceans. There's no oxygen in the oceans. And all of this happened, all of that horrible stuff happened between 60,000 and 120,000 years. So just that little snippet of time, way less than a million years, all of this horrible stuff happened. And one of the main things that dies out are the trilobites. So um, those little arthropod creatures, do I have one just close? I don't have a trilobite close, but anywho, Trilobites made it through three other extinction events. They took a hit every single time, but this one, this biggest mass extinction of all time, finally wiped out the, the sad little trilobites. I feel so sad. Um, actually, I can show you a picture of a trilobite from my book. Let's do that. I think, I think I've got it on screen. Well, this little guy. But anyways, so, the Permian mass extinction was really bad and hopefully life never goes through that again. Now, so these pictures on screen are kind of fun. So this is what the late Permian looked like before the extinction event. So you've got trees, you've got ferns, you've got all this wonderful life. It looks very lush, it looks very nice. Remember this little face right here because we're gonna talk about it later. This is Lystrosaurus. This is after the extinction or during the extinction event, really. So here's these toxic sludge waters that are just choked with toxic algae. You've got um, all these plants have died probably from acid rain and forest fires. You can kind of see a fire back here. And then again, Lystrosaurus is still there. So again, our major survivor of this extinction event um, is Lystrosaurus. But we'll talk about, like I said, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So now, the late Triassic. This one's kind of fun because the Triassic gets like a reputation for having a lot of weird stuff alive during this time. So the Triassic is actually bounded by two major mass extinction events. You have the largest mass extinction of all time that starts the Triassic. And then at the very end of the Triassic, about 201 million years ago, you get another mass extinction event that has about an 80% extinction rate. So that was pretty bad. That was a pretty bad day for everything that tried to live during the Triassic. So in this case, we think that we had supercontinent Pangaea was splitting apart. And because of that, it released a bunch of volcanic eruptions and boom, you get it again. Um, so what's fun on this photo is while everything on here basically looks like a dinosaur, especially these two big ones right here in the foreground, those, neither of those are dinosaurs. Actually, the only dinosaur I think is this little bitty guy back here. You got a pterosaur and I think this is a mammal reptile. But these two charismatic creatures right up front are neither a dinosaur. So um, this is an Aetosaur and this is a Rossukian. So they are croc relatives that actually started to look like dinosaurs before dinosaurs took off. Now, the huge flood basalts again, so these, uh, the ground has cracked open and lava is just kind of pouring out, was happening where Pangaea was rifting apart, where it was splitting apart, kind of like the Horn of Africa is doing right now. We think there were about four pulses over 600,000 years. So this one is a little spread out a little bit more than the Permian extinction event, but the, the worst happened, the worst spike of the extinction happened um, about 40,000 years. So over the course of 40,000 years was kind of the worst part. We think that lava may have fountained, so just, just like a water fountain, um, over a mile high from these fissures that are spewing out all of this lava. And it covered over 38 square miles. That seems way too small. Maybe I forgot some zeros, maybe 38,000 square miles. That sounds more like it. Um, so again, on land are these croc-like animals that are dominating. So dinosaurs only made up about six to 10% of their ecosystems. They were small fried potatoes. They were, they were not um, the dominant forms of life yet. And so really you had these, um, the extinction of the Rossukians, 
So at the end of the Triassic, um, the Rossukians are taken out and these other little things called Aetosaurs were taken out. And because of that, they left open the dominant terrestrial niche. So the dominant land life niche where things can move in. And that actually opened the way for our friend, the dinosaurs to take over. Now, of course, with these big volcanic eruptions, you get all of the things that go along with it. Increased CO2, more acidic oceans, acid rain, all that stuff. Um, but again, while it was devastating to a lot of things, it allowed the dinosaurs to take over. So this is, uh, in case you're wondering if I have any Rossukian and Aetosaur fans in, in, the, in the audience, this is Postosuchus. And this is Desmatosuchus. So there you go. All right, here we are. We are at our last of the big five. So this is the end Cretaceous extinction event. It's also called the KPG. So K for Cretaceous. Um, chalk in German is with a K and Cretaceous is like the chalk layers. Anyways, but that's why we call it the KPG. And then Paleogene is the start of the Cenozoic above uh, beyond that so if you've ever heard kpg that's where that comes from so this takes place about 66 million years ago it had a 76 percent extinction rate and this one is basically the giant space rock impact and then you also had some large volcanic eruptions that were going on before that and probably was just like the perfect storm going on here so those uh, volcanic eruptions were in India, they're called the Deccan Traps, but a lot of researchers think that the main trigger for this extinction event was the impact that happened in Chicxulub. So let's talk about that impact because it was a pretty bad day. It was like a really, really, really bad day. And we think it happened in the early summer because of some really awesome fossil localities that we have. So sometime in the early summer, an estimated seven mile wide asteroid slammed into our planet. And this asteroid was bigger than Mount Everest. Like if we could just like pick Mount Everest up, the asteroid was bigger than all of Mount Everest. And it was moving up to 25 miles per second, per second, not per hour, per second. And it struck now what's the Yucatan Peninsula in Central America, so right there in Mexico. The impact created so much heat that for a moment, for a moment, the impact site was hotter than the sun's surface. So our planet right there at the point of impact was hotter than the surface of the sun. It liquefied, obviously, it liquefied all the rock around it, and it instantly created a hole more than 20 miles deep. So it <clears throat> plowed into our surface and plowed down, liquefied the surface, and created an impact area, a crater that was more than 20 miles thick. It was like 100 million megatons of TNT went off at the same time. Boom! 100 million megatons. Anything within a thousand miles of the impact would have been set on fire. Just phew, anything within a thousand mile radius was toast, uh, instantly toast. Material was injected into the orbit and spread around the globe in an hour. So it actually punched a hole in our ozone layer. So there could be bits of dinosaurs floating in space, which I think is probably the coolest part about all of this, is there could be dinosaur bone floating in space. So after all that objective went around, circled the globe, covered the globe, they started falling. So meteorites started falling out of the sky and it would have turned the sky red and it would have broiled the surface. So at home on your oven, there's a thing called broil. It is really, really hot. That's basically what happened to the surface of our planet after this impact. Then there was the sonic boom. This was kind of the last horrible thing that happened from this. So a blast of air that traveled almost 200 miles per hour when it was like 2000 miles away from the impact site. So that sonic boom was still traveling over 200 miles per hour, 2000 miles away. 
that's a big blast of hot air. So like stronger winds than most hurricanes was just blowing across everywhere. It caused landslides and earthquakes and tsunamis. Basically all the stuff too that was left in the atmosphere that wasn't big enough to rain back down to earth blocked out the sun and cooled the climate. So it, it had kind of the opposite effect is, is what we're thinking of. So it actually cooled the climate, kind of made us in a, a nuclear winter. And this caused a food chain breakdown. So what happens if there's no sun? Well, plants can't grow. Well, what about if you're a mega ton herbivore that needs to eat over a thousand pounds of vegetation a day and all the plants die? Well, then you're gonna die. And then what if you're a big giant land predator that needs to eat like 5,000 pounds of meat every day and all of your main course goes extinct? Well, then you go extinct. So there was really kind of a bias, almost a size bias, to this extinction event. So the plants die, the big herbivores die, and the big terrestrial carnivores also die. Basically the biggest thing that makes it out of this extinction event is like a crocodile size. Everything bigger than a crocodile, toast. Most survivors, again, were small and they were scavengers or omnivores. So they weren't real specific. They could basically eat whatever they could get, especially if you were a scavenger for a while, it would be like a smorgasbord because everything died. Omnivores and insectivores did really well as also. And those things that had the ability to hide or burrow. So hide in like a tree hollow or burrow underground or like some alligators can just like basically hang out and do nothing for like a year and they don't have to eat they don't have to do anything they just like chill for like a year so animals that could like I said small that had generalist diets and that could hide or just kind of chill for a little while were what survived this extinction event if you were big on a herbivore and a carnivore specifically you're basically toast. So that's what happened at the end of the Cretaceous, our most recent mass extinction event. Okay, so now that we've talked about how everything died, let's talk about how things survived. How did life recover after these mass extinction events? And I have here the famous horseshoe crab because while trilobites and horseshoe crab are very kind of closely related, a horseshoe crab is the closest we can get to a trilobite nowadays, trilobites and horseshoe crab also evolved roughly about the same time over 500 million years ago. The horseshoe crabs made it through. So they are definitely a survivor in my book. So let's think about how a mass extinction happens, how this timeline happens. So you start off with the pre-extinction. So before the extinction ever happened, you have high levels of biodiversity. So you got a lot of life everywhere, right? And then you have your extinction. So the biodiversity is wiped out. Then you have the, oh, excuse me. Then you have the recovery period. So it's low diversity, but it's dominated by these disaster taxa, which we're going to talk about in just a second. And then post-extinction is when you have returned to the pre-extinction levels of diversity again. And this takes time. So this is a, a, um, a process, if you will. So everything gets wiped out. You have some of these disaster tax that come in. You've got life, but it's really low diversity. And then finally, you make it post-extinction and you return to the pre-levels of diversity. But these could look very different. This group of animals and this group of animals could look very different. So let's look at that. So here's your pre-extinction. This is, this is just a schematic. Um, there's, there's nothing. This isn't like a specific mass extinction event, especially um, because there's this thing that looks kind of like, I don't know, maybe it's an alligator. I don't know. But anyways, there's a ship here. It really kind of confuses me. But anyways, the schematic is really great because so you have this pre-extinction time. So look at all this life. This is all the life that lives down in the sea floor, in the mud. You have all these corals and fish and sharks and just whales. A ton of stuff is living and thriving in this pre-extinction environment. Then you have whatever kind of trigger, your volcano, your climate change, whatever, and it kills everything. So here's the extinction. You can see there's like nothing. 
there's nothing really going on in this little extinction bubble. But then you have recovery. So if you notice this recovery, there's a whole bunch of animals is just like all of the stuff living in the seafloor mud is the same type of little shell. And then if you look out here, it's kind of just like a lot of repeats of the same type of life. Like then you got some jellies up here, some jellyfish, very few, very, very few fishes. But life is coming back, but it's still not as diverse. And there's also low diversity. So you don't have as many different types of life in this recovery period as you do pre extinction or post extinction. So again, once we get over to this last panel, you have your post extinction. Again, tons of life in the seafloor mud, tons of life living on the seafloor, swimming above it. But you can see this post extinction is much different than the pre extinction. It's just the levels of diversity that have come back. So we have the same amount of diversity, but a lot of different life. It looks completely different. And that's usually what happens after big mass extinction events is the whatever life takes over post extinction is very, very different than what it looked like pre extinction. So I want to focus on this little recovery area. What is happening during the recovery period after a mass extinction event? So survivors, who survives? Mostly who survives mass extinction event. So a small generalized forms that have shorter generation times and can live in a wide range of ecosystems. So basically what that says is the animal is small and it's very generalized. It's not specialized. It doesn't have any like special features and things like that, like say a hummingbird bill. That's a very specialized feature and it's specifically for drinking nectar out of really deep flowers. Okay, that's a very specialized form. So these are small, they're generalized, they have short generation times. And so, for example, a human generation time is about 25 years. But let's say a mouse generation time is probably only like a year or less. So things that have a shorter generation time. And then they can live in a wide range of ecosystems. So they can live in a hot environment, a cold environment, a wet environment, a dry environment. It doesn't have to be very specific. So there's certain plants that can only live in a very narrow range of temperature and moisture. So like it can't rain too much, it can't rain too little. There are certain plants that have to live in very narrow strips of elevation. They can only live between 1400 and 1450 feet of elevation. So that's very specific. So we're looking for small generalized forms that have short generation times and can live in a wide range of ecosystems. These are the types of things that survive mass extinction events. So I want to look at this in a little closer and just take two animals that are alive today and think about them. So we're going to talk about a rat and an elephant, a generalist, and a specialist. Sometimes elephants are considered generalists um, in their own ecosystems, but we're thinking about planet-wide here, and so I am considering it a specialist. So with the rat, a small, super small, of course, um, there are some big rats like the landmine hunting rats in Africa that are like my favorite species of rat, but most of them are small, so we're going to stay with the little city rats, the black rats. Gestation. This means how long pregnancy lasts. So for a rat, it's only 23 days and they can have eight or more babies, usually between eight and 20 <laughs> babies. And they can do this almost every 23 days. So again, a human gestation period is nine months. So this is way, way shorter. Their diet, they're an omnivore. Rats can eat basically anything. Anything that's around, they can eat it. And their habitat is extremely widespread. Basically, they don't live in the Arctic Circle or in, or in Antarctica. Elsewhere, they're everywhere. They're absolutely everywhere. Now, when we compare a rat to an elephant, elephants are large. They're huge. They're multi-ton creatures. Their gestation period is 22 months. That means that elephants are pregnant for almost two years and they only have one calf at a time and they very rarely have calves every single year. It's usually every five to six or more years they have another baby. 
they're herbivores, specifically herbivores. They can only eat plants and they live in warm areas. They live in warm forests or warm grasslands. So they really don't tolerate the cold well. So when we compare these two animals, the rat would be the much better survivor of a mass extinction event than an elephant would be based on their size, how long they're pregnant, their diet, and their habitat. So <clears throat> some of these survivors end up becoming disaster taxa. So disaster taxa are opportunistic animals that have a short-term bloom after the event kills off most of the life in that area. So disaster taxa can happen just with minor extinctions, and they can also happen with major mass extinction events. So a disaster taxa, for example, um, there's two kind of real classic disaster species out there. The first one are ferns ferns. Yep, just your regular old run-of-the-mill fern. So fern spikes, so all of a sudden in the fossil record you get a huge spike of ferns and it, it, it happens right after a mass extinction event. And this one is actually really closely associated with the KPG, so the Cretaceous extinction event. Um, and so you can see, boom, this fern spike in the fossil record, but they're also associated with local extinction events. So for example, in 1980, Mount St. Helens went off and just obliterated the life around that mountain or that volcano. And some of the first things that came back after that volcanic eruption were ferns. So we know this is a really good indicator of what's happening after an extinction event um, is if you have a big fern spike. And the reason why ferns are some of the first to reproduce and succeed and thrive after an extinction event is because they re reproduce by a high number of wind dispersed spores. So their spores don't need to land on another flower and then pollinate the flower. Their spores are ready to go. They just need to land and have light and poof. And so if you've had a big kill off, usually that area has been cleared. And so there's lots of light on the ground and you have these windblown spores and then poof, all of a sudden you have ferns taking over and they kind of revitalize. They kind of um, clean up these, these areas that have been completely wiped of all their life and allow more life to come back in after they've kind of cleaned it up and made it nice for everybody. So you get these fern spikes, but then they drop off as other plants finally take back over. Now, the other classic disaster taxa is fungus. So fungal spikes are associated with the Permian mass extinction. So again, after that mass extinction, you get this big spike in fungus. Now, it kind of makes sense because, you know, if 95% of life everywhere goes extinct, you're going to need a lot of decomposers. So fungus kind of have a heyday anywhere that a lot of life is killed off because it needs to be decomposed. So the Permian extinction um, represents this widespread devastation of vegetation, where the fungus comes in and breaks down all of that vegetation. So these are disaster taxa. Now there are a couple of others and there could be animals um, that are disaster taxa too. But usually in this recovery period, this is what you see. This low diversity domination of these opportunistic species that bloom when everything else dies off in an area. So how long does it take to recover from one of these big mass extinctions? Well, it can take up to 10 million years for life to fully recover from a mass extinction event. So it's estimated that it takes about 2 million years to kind of reestablish a stable and resilient ecosystem. But to really get to those pre-extinction levels of diversity, you need about 10 million years. So that's a pretty long time of recovery to get over a mass extinction event. But again, life recovers, life survives, life keeps going. So now we're down to our last thing, Lystrosaurus 
one of my favorite animals in the fossil record. So who is Lystrosaurus? Well, Lystrosaurus is a, a very weird herbivorous dicenodont therapsid. So what that means is it's like a non-mammal mammal relative. I know that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but it's on the lineage that would lead to mammals, but instead its lineage split off before mammals. So it is a relative, but it's not a direct relative, I guess. Um, these are very weird little mammals, uh, animals. They're not technically mammals. Sometimes people call these um, um, mammal-like reptiles, but that's not quite right either. Um, but again, they're they're in a weird group of their own. They lived from 265 million to 247 million years ago. So that means they lived in the late Permian and in the early Triassic. So hmm, this is where the survivor comes in. <clears throat> This little map here shows you what the Earth looked like in the uh, early Triassic. And these stars here, these red stars, show major Lystrosaurus um, localities where we have found a lot of Lystrosaurus. And that would be South Africa, Antarctica, India, and China. So that's what these would become someday, is this big giant thing down here would become uh, Antarctica. India would split off here and go north. Here is Africa and South America. They would split apart. Here's North America, um, Eurasia up here. Okay, so they were really widespread, especially in the southern portion of Pangaea. So this is the supercontinent Pangaea, and we have them kind of all over the place, really. And here's how big they got. So they were usually small, but there were some very large individuals, especially before the Permian extinction. They were they were pretty large. After the Permian extinction, they stayed fairly small. So they, you could kind of classify these as pig size. Like a big sow would be about this big, but your normal everyday little piggies down here. Also, they were very odd looking, super, super odd looking. They only had two teeth, a pair of tusks, um, their tusk-like canine was it. Um, they moved with this semi-sprawling gait and had dimpled, leathery, hairless skin. So we've actually found some mummified versions of these, some mummified fossils that have preserved skin, and there's no hair follicles. So they had weird, dimpled, leathery, hairless skin, and this little beak for nipping vegetation. So these guys were plant eaters. Now, the reason why I call this such a survivor is because it survived the Great Dying. It's one of the few land animals that actually survived that extinction event, and it was the most common land vertebrate in the early Triassic. In some fossil beds, they represent up to 95% of the total individuals. This is like world domination here for Lystrosaurus. No other animal has dominated a period of time like Lystrosaurus did. So think about that. You go out to a fossil bed, and you're like, hey, let's look for a bunch of fossils. And almost everything you find is a Lystrosaurus. It was, it's basically telling you that everything alive in that environment was a Lystrosaurus. So how did it survive? What, what characteristics did it have that made it such a survivor? Well, there's a couple of things. It was a digger. It lived in burrows underground. So just like the Cretaceous extinction event when I said that things that could burrow and get out of harm, harm's way did better at surviving, that's exactly what Lystrosaurus did. So it could burrow, it could live underground, and also it had a, a big barrel chest and we think it had really efficient lungs. When you're breathing underground, that's pretty dirty air. There's a lot of dust and contaminants in the air, so you need a very good respiratory system. And also, if outside your burrow is completely obliterated too and everything is gross outside, if you already have a built-in system to breathe bad air, that's pretty good for you. So that's the first thing. They lived in burrows underground with an effective breathing system. They were also wanderers. We think that they were really good at locating new places to live. So, oh, the water's bad here. I'm just going to get up and move and just go to somewhere else that's a little better. And so we think that they could move around and then they could migrate and they were very, very good at finding 
new places to live, kind of like an elephant where they can smell water from miles away. Maybe Listrosaurus could too. They were also adaptable. So there is some evidence that Listrosaurus could kind of hibernate, not true hibernation, but close to hibernation. So whenever things got real stressful, whenever things got real bad, they could just kind of hang out and chill in their burrows and wait for the time to get a little better. So it wasn't true hibernation, but it was a hibernation-like state that they could get into. Also, after the extinction rate, we see that their sizes decreased. So overall body size got smaller and they started reproducing earlier. So they didn't live as long. So they only lasted a few years instead of like tens of years, but they were reproducing earlier and having more babies. And they think that that could have increased their chances of survival by 40% by adopting this kind of mate often and mate early type of life. So they could have babies earlier and have a lot more babies throughout their lives. And then also, <clears throat> There doesn't seem to have been any natural predators of these things. Nothing was eating them. So they really had no threats. Um, one idea was that all of the carnivores that survived were too small to eat Lystrosaurus. Maybe, but it does seem like they didn't really have any natural predators. So these four things, being able to dig, being able to wander and find new places to live, being adaptable, hibernating, reproducing early, and having no natural predators are probably the main thing of why they survived. But also, a little bit of luck. You can't survive the biggest mass extinction of all time without having a little bit of luck. So with that, thank you all so much for your attention, and I would be happy to answer any of your questions. Well, thank you so much for that. I know there was one question that popped in the chat. I know we've got some hands here as well, but one of them that was in the chat that popped up earlier was, um, how do you know what they look like and how do you know like how long ago they live like what's that process if you talk right. to all different organisms right so how we know what they look like uh we we don't we make our best guesses so what we do is we compare their bodies with something that's alive today so everything has bones and muscles and skin. And those are thicknesses that we kind of know. So we can add and flesh them out and kind of look at their faces. But again, it's a huge guess. We're not 100% sure ever what some of these look like unless we find like a full one. Like we get really lucky in the ice age so we can find completely mummified frozen mammoth, for example, and it shows us exactly what they look like, what color their hair was, how much fat they had on them, things like that. But for like Lystrosaurus, it's a huge guess. We think we got it pretty good since we found those mummified specimens so we know what their skin looked like, but for a lot of other animals, we don't know. Now the second part of that uh, how do we know how old some of these things are? There's a couple of different ways that we can do this. One, the best way is actually getting a date. So if we can find a volcanic ash layer, we can shoot some laser beams at us and it kicks back some information. And from there, we can calculate how old that ash layer is. The other way is by relative dating, just pairing the layers and the life within it to other layers and life within it. So if you've got stuff up here that you don't find down here, this unit is younger than this unit. But it has to do with radiometric dating mostly is how we figure out how old stuff is. Great question. Awesome. Other questions? Yeah. How long did the uh, Lysiosaurus live? So let's see here. It was like... 265 to something. I can't remember my dates off the top of my head. It lasted for quite a few millions of years for sure. Now, of course, this wasn't all um, the same species. So we think that there were at least, at least six different species of Lystrosaurus. Um, let me go back to my little thing here. 265 to 247 um, million years is when it lived. Yeah.
um, down here, Jordan up front. Okay. How can you tell the difference between uh, the reptile and the mammal fossils? That's a really good question. And it's not easy to answer that question either because it wasn't like just one day you had a reptile and then boom, the next day you had a mammal and they were completely different. There's actually kind of a gray scale. So there's certain characteristics that we think of being more reptilian and then more mammalian. So you go from fully reptile to kind of reptile to kind of mammal to more mammal to total mammal. So we can look at things like the lower jaw, the inner ear. So mammals have really specialized hearing. We have these tiny little bones in our ears. Well, those tiny little bones used to actually be full size jaw bones. And we can see the evolution and the migration of these bones to where we only have one jaw bone and reptiles have four jaw bones all the way up into the inner ear. So you can look at that to see how far those bones have come. That's one way. And there's a couple of other things. Mammals usually hold their legs right underneath them. And reptiles kind of do this push up number here. So if you also are looking at the anatomy, how far are the legs directly under the body in comparison to being sprawled out? But again, it's a gray scale. And when you get into that weird little middle zone, it is very hard to be like, yes it's a reptile or yes, it's a mammal. That's why we come up with these terms like mammal-like reptile. So it's still a reptile, but it has some mammal characteristics, but not enough to be an actual mammal. Same thing with dinosaurs and birds. It's the exact same thing. You have dinosaur, sort of dinosaur, kind of bird, more bird, total bird. So it's a grayscale. Great question. Yeah, the grayscale question. So did any big carnivores or herbivores survive the great extinction? Which which one? <laughs> which one? The great dying? Yeah, sorry. Yes, there were some larger carnivores, but again, mostly crocodile size um, carnivores made it through, but not <clears throat> not anything any bigger than that. There were some bigger uh of carnivores, but again, that was kind of a size one too, where it wiped out most everything bigger than a crocodile. Hmm? One kind of general question I know, kind of plants and seeds, we're just in the initial phases of, of our own learning is, have you shared kind of this big picture of systems of survival looking through those five mass extinctions? And we started looking about our daily lives here now, present times, and also about the future. Um, I know you live and breathe in the past, but you're also obviously living and breathing today. Are there certain like themes or things that, you know, kind of pop up as, as we start to think about not just the past, as we start to look at the, the present and future in terms of survival, those systems that are like thematic throughout that, that we might want to be thinking about in the back of our minds while we continue our learning? For sure, for sure. One of the main things, I think the most important theme of all these extinction is the rate of change. So how fast are systems changing? So the reason why some of these mass extinctions were so extreme is because they happened so fast. Nothing could really um, reproduce fast enough to keep up with these changes. The environments changed so drastically that again, you get these feedback cycles and just toppling down, toppling down, toppling down. So a lot of people say, oh, well, why should we be worried about climate change today when obviously there's been a lot of horrible climate change in the past? And my response to that is the rate of change that we're seeing today is, um, uncomparable to the fossil record. So we've seen how horrible some of this rate of change is. So for the Permian, it may have happened, that extinction may have happened in less than 100,000 years. But the rate of change that we're seeing on our planet right now due, due to human-driven climate change is even faster. So that's one of the biggest takeaways that I would say is the rate of change during an, an event, any type of event, whether it leads to extinction or not, is the rate of change. How fast are things going extinct? How fast are they changing? 
Awesome. Well, I know we probably have a million questions, and I know there's other <laughs> classes that have questions, and there's also other classes that will watch the recording. Um, and so I want to be respectful of your time as well, because I know we're already uh, over our hour. And so what I'll do is I will curate some of those questions, and I'll send them there just so their voices can still be heard, but also I know you've got other thing called a job to do too so we appreciate <laughs> carving that out so um we'll collect their questions and the rest and we'll definitely follow up and be in touch but um yeah. i do want to say thank you for your time a lot of that knowledge we're probably wondering why we're doing all this and it all is going to start to connect here soon but this has been a great launching pad for us to think about surviving through the lens of uh, mass extinction so um great we can't thank you enough for your time and your expertise Yes, thank you all for your questions and your attention. And I will, I will, I would love to answer your questions in email form. So for sure, send them my way, and I'll, I'll get you all of those answers. Awesome! Thank you so much. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Yes.